Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland, and I'm back again this week with another bonus episode. Uh, Things just went over so well last week that I wanted to check back in with you. I know this situation with the coronavirus and the pandemic is just unprecedented, and it's impacting us and our work and our careers every single day, and honestly, it's evolving every day. So I wanted to take a minute and check back in with you about sort of the latest that I'm seeing. And I want to start with some findings that Glassdoor has presented along with some findings from LinkedIn. And then I want to talk a little bit about if you are thinking about job searching right now in this market, because I know that is a really daunting idea. (laughs) And I've gotten a lot of questions lately about should I do it? Our company is still hiring, so I hope I can answer some of your questions. So let's start first with some of the findings that Glassdoor came out with. And I'll be honest, these um, came out the end of March, so they are a few days uh, old, and I think this is going to continue to evolve. But Glassdoor actually did a survey uh, to understand sort of employee confidence and the response to employers. Um, like, let me see. Uh, employee confidence in the response that employers have had. That's that's what I'm trying to say. And what they found through their study, Glassdoor, was that employees really appreciate remote work, but employers themselves are actually pretty divided in their response. And I can imagine that, right? I think a lot of employers weren't set up to be remote or virtual before this happened. So it says nearly three in 10 employees across all income ranges said their employer has done nothing in response to concerns of the COVID coronavirus outbreak. Now, keep in mind, this is a few days ago. I suspect it's kind of changed a little bit since then. Um, Also, they found that 67% of employees said they would support the decision by their employer to mandate employees to work from home indefinitely due to the coronavirus outbreak. That's kind of interesting. And they also found only 16% of employees said that their companies were offering additional paid and unpaid sick leave in response to concerns about the outbreak. I think that's really unfortunate. I sure hope that employers are beginning to change their stance on that because it's tough with all of these things going on. Not only could you get sick, but your family might get sick. I mean, there are just so many things sort of at play right now that are just not normal. Well, Glassdoor also looked at the confidence and remote work capability. So like our ability as employees to do our jobs from home. And they found that three in 10 U.S. employees, so 60%, said that they're confident that they can efficiently do their jobs remotely. And if they're required to work from home indefinitely, they're happy to do so, right? Um, 50% of employees said they think they would be equally productive or more productive working from home as opposed to working in the office. And then this is where it gets a little interesting to me. Um, They looked at the confidence about working from home broken down by age, and they found that 68% of employees between the ages of 18 and 34 reported being confident in being able to efficiently do their work remotely. This is compared to only 44% of employees between the ages of 55 and 64. So isn't that interesting? The younger folks, hands down, almost 70% feel that they can do their job from home compared with only 44% of older people. And, you know, that's, I just find that fascinating. I have to think that it is at least somewhat related to that age group, 18 to 34, being the group that grew up with the internet. And I also wonder too, those are probably the individual contributors for the most part in the company versus the older employees 
may be the ones who are holding leadership positions that may rely more like on things like in-person meetings. The one thing though that's missing here is they did the age group from 18 to 34 and then 55 to 64, but they don't mention what it was from 35 to 54. So I'm not sure what, if you notice, there's a gap in the the ages. I'm not sure what the confidence is there. Um, They also broke it down by gender and they found that 25% of female employees reported that it isn't possible to do their job remotely compared to only 14% of male employees. So that's interesting. Um, I could see that, you know, going back to sort of the types of jobs, sometimes women sometimes hold more like uh, administrative types of jobs, which sometimes do require you to be in person. They also asked parents how they felt in terms of confidence level. Now I'm talking about people who are working that have kids that are still young. So they found that 71% of employed parents with children under the age of 18 said that they feel confident that they can effectively do their job from home. So it looks like most parents are feeling pretty comfortable. And that makes sense. I mean, I think parents know how to multitask, right? They're always probably trying to do all sorts of different things. Um, But it is interesting, I guess, that that there's almost 30% that are concerned and aren't really sure that they can do that. The other thing that Glassdoor broke down is distractions. So as you know, working from home, as you found out probably in the last two, three weeks, comes with a lot of distractions. And I don't know about you, but um, you know, I know that I would love to spend more time, uh, for example, eating or listening to music. I'm sure there's lots of distractions that uh, would be interesting during the day. And uh, it sounds like you probably agree. So the top distractions that Glassdoor identified, the very top uh, was TV, 32%. Lack of human interaction was 22%. Hmm. It says people are concerned about going stir crazy when being encouraged to work from home. Uh, 27% were concerned about at home childcare. I could see that. It's hard to manage the kids while you're at home, while you're trying to work. And A quarter of employed parents with children under the age of 18 cited lack of social interaction was a concern with working from home compared to only 18% of employees without children under the age of 18. So it's kind of interesting. My guess is that the attention of the parents is really having to go into the kids. Um, And there's probably not a lot of downtime, right? Because they're balancing and juggling between uh, working and, and the kids, a lot of kids are being sent home with schoolwork that they have to do. And even if they don't have schoolwork, it's how do you keep them entertained? You know, it's a, it's a lot. So anyhow, it sounds like we as a country are really in a transition right now. Um, I really wonder what will happen after this is over, right? If we are all working from home until June, are our companies going to want us to come back to the office later? I mean, maybe they will, but I bet there will be some companies that say, you know what? We've learned how to work remotely because we had to, and now let's save some money on real estate and get rid of that office. I mean, I could see it. Well, so the the other thing, so we've covered, I guess, how people are feeling about working from home. Now let's talk about job searching because that I'm getting a lot of questions about. Um, people are asking me, like, should I still be job searching? It seems like there's no point <laughs> in job searching. And, um, you know, I think, I think in some industries, things are really being put on hold. I have seen companies that have decided to put hiring, just they're freezing it until they know what's going on. Um, and I, I honestly, I can't blame them. Uh, but I do think there are many companies that are hiring. So there's a couple of categories. One is the workers that, you know, are considered essential. Companies are continuing to hire them at a very rapid pace. And the other category 
where I think you see hiring still going on, it's within businesses that are able to easily operate remotely and within industries that are less impacted. So I think if you look sort of across the board, industries that have been impacted the most are things like automotive and travel, um, maybe even retail like clothing. So things that you would typically get in person. Those are some of the areas that have been the hardest hit. But I think surprisingly, some of the online marketing, digital types of things uh, have been less hit than we would think. So before I get too far into my thoughts on interviewing, I want to share with you some data that LinkedIn has released regarding job searching and job demand. And they just released this a few days ago. Um, So I do think this is still very relevant. They released both the top 10 most in-demand jobs in the U.S. and the companies with the most open jobs in the U.S., right? So let's start with the top 10 most in-demand jobs right now. Number one is store associate. Number two, system operator. Number three, public accountant, like CPA. Number four is healthcare specialist. Five is construction worker. Six, warehouse manager. Seven, psychologist. Eight, vehicle mechanic. Nine, academic advisor. And 10, delivery driver. Now, you can kind of let that soak in for a second. <laughs> if you think about it, I, this list makes a lot of sense to me. These are primarily jobs that are done in person right? These are people that are considered essential, people working in warehouses, people driving deliveries. Um, Many of them are essential. Healthcare specialists, again, essential. Um, The CPA, I have to think it's because it's tax time. (laughs) I have to think it's because it's April. Um, That's my best guess there. Psychologist, it would seem that maybe it could be influenced by people feeling so stressed by the pandemic. I mean, that again would make a lot of sense. So those are some of the things that are the most in-demand jobs in the U.S. right now. And I believe, let's see. The way that they calculated it, just to give you an idea, um, they looked at week over week changes in terms of demand of job postings. So they looked at the volume of job postings on LinkedIn uh, over different weeks in March. So they looked to see, you know, where things grew, which is really interesting. I mean, LinkedIn and Glassdoor and Indeed, they all have so much access to data. It's pretty incredible. All right. So with that said, let's go on to the companies with the most open jobs in the U.S. Top 10. Number one, 7-Eleven. Number two, Army National Guard. Three, KPMG. Number four is Amazon. Number five, Genentech. Number six, Lowe's. Seven, HCA Healthcare. Number eight, Intuit. Number nine, Whole Foods. And number 10, Sherman Williams. These take a little more thought (laughs) to think about why these make sense. I think things like 7 Eleven and Whole Foods make a lot of sense because you've got people who are trying to shop and keep food on their in their pantries at home, right? Amazon makes sense. People are shopping and ordering things on Amazon like crazy right now. The Army National Guard makes sense because We have this national emergency going on. Um, Healthcare makes sense. And then I think things like Intuit, you know, they make sense in terms of they are a technology business, right? And I think we could could dig in more and understand why. Um, The other thing I, I would assume too with Intuit is, again, it is tax time. The one on this list... Well, I guess there's maybe two that I find kind of interesting are Lowe's and Sherman Williams. Sherman Williams, I think, is just a paint store. 
I, I, and I'm probably wrong. I mean, surely they are selling more than just paint. But I think both Lowe's and Sherman Williams are very much focused around home improvement. And it makes me think that we are all at home organizing our closets <laughs> and, and cleaning out our garages while we are stuck at home. And that's actually really, really great. Well, with that said, um, I hope it'll bring you a little bit of peace to think about the fact that companies are still hiring. Um, like I said, I really believe the areas that you can look at the most right now are the essential worker functions and then also industries where you could normally work from home. So things that are related to technology and again, in industries that have had less of a financial impact through this crisis. So given that, <laughs> you may be thinking, okay, so what do I do? And if you're like a lot of people and you know, who knows? I know I'm very busy right now, but many people I've spoken with do actually have free time right now. Um, so it's the perfect time to start working on your job search. And I know I always say that if you listen to my show, um, I'm always saying this is the best time. That's the best time. <laughs> it's always the best time, right? But really think about it. When are you going to have a couple of months to yourself little bit of free time to think about your goals, to work on your resume. And hey, if you start interviewing, companies are actually interviewing remotely. So they are interviewing over the phone and over Zoom. So you know what else? You don't have to sneak out to your car or anywhere else while you're at work to take a job interview. You can just do it from your house. <laughs> so <laughs> it couldn't be better for the companies that are still hiring. Now, don't get me wrong. I do want to say fewer companies are hiring and there are fewer jobs. No doubt. Okay. But it's still happening. Like I've legit seen companies go through the interview process with, with candidates, candidates that were already in process, new candidates, and they're going through the entire process with them. I've seen companies give job offers and I've even seen companies start doing onboarding remotely. So just don't lose hope. There are jobs out there. Of course, there are not enough jobs right now, but this is a great time to sort of work on the foundation of your job search. You know, it's like building a house. You've got to get the basics done. So when you think about what are the basics, you know, I would really focus on two main things. One is your LinkedIn and one is your resume. And frankly, I'd start with the resume, to be honest. Um, I'll give you just a few tips. I mean, resumes are hard. You should know that it's not just you. Um, it's way easier to help other people with their resume than to do your own. Um, over the years, I've worked with over 800 job seekers individually and many, many more in, in larger groups. But I can tell you that I can help someone else with their resume all day long, but you asked me to redo mine. <laughs> It's very stressful because you're cramming like 20 years of your life onto two pages in the most concise way that you can with tons of different like font sizes and bullets. And I mean, it's just, it's a formatting. I don't, it's, it has potential to be a formatting disaster. <laughs> so don't get frustrated though. You can do it. It's not hard. Um, you know, look up resume templates online just to get an idea of what kind of layout that you want. If you work in a creative field, I would recommend looking at etsy.com. And Etsy actually strangely has a ton of resume templates. I would recommend them for people in sales, in marketing, anything creative. If you work in engineering or technology, do not use templates from Etsy. Use the old school Microsoft Word, like basic layout. I've noticed employers in different categories or for different job types have very different expectations. So if you work in a creative field, your resume should look a little more creative. If you work in a traditional field, it should be more traditional. Anyway, um, be sure to update your resume with your current job, all your previous work experience. 
you should have it updated with your skills, with computer skills, with, you know, soft skills, the whole thing. You should have an objective or a profile at the top where you describe who you are and what you want. You know, just really kind of like get it started. If you've already got one, go back in and try to be sure it's up to date. Be sure it represents you well. As you're looking at it, one thing you do want to be sure to do is be sure that your resume quantifies your results using numbers. So for example, I will give you an example. Uh, Years ago, I worked for a big home services company and I supported four of the brands there. One of the brands in particular was the one that I focused most of my energy on, and I helped them to get their online digital marketing program going. I helped them with things like email marketing, search engine optimization, paid search, social media, you know, optimizing the website, like the whole deal. And it was very successful. So if I told you that, you'd say, oh, all right, interesting. But this is the thing. When I started there, the company had a website. When I left, I was helping to generate over 60% of their U.S. sales online. Over 60%. Telling you that number, it's so much more impactful than just telling you that I did email marketing. Telling you the millions of dollars that I helped that company to generate it's so much more valuable to an employer than just telling them that you know about social media. So look for opportunities to share results. And if you're not sure what to share, look at your old performance reviews. If you do an annual or six-month performance evaluation, oftentimes those evaluations will have numbers in them that you can pull from. Now, you may say to me, Angela, my job doesn't have anything to do with money. And I don't know what to put down. Well, you can also look at things like frequency. Did you support a number of clients? If so, how many? Did you lead webinars or did you lead in-person training? If so, how many? Did you review certain types of documents or did you, you know, just again, think of frequency and you can take a guess. You can always put approximately if you don't know the exact number. Anyway, I'm kind of going on a tangent, but there are two things you don't want to include on your resume. One is your photo. No photos on resumes, at least not in the U.S. There are certain countries where that is the norm, but not in the U.S. at all. Uh, The other thing you don't need on your resume are your references. So you will include your references um, on the actual application itself, not on your resume. Let's see. The last tip I'll give on the resume today is be sure that you have your contact information. You want to show at a minimum the city and state where you live, your phone number, and your email address. And if you have a home phone, just put your cell phone, right? You don't need both, and you don't even have to specify that it's cell phone. We, we know that it's your cell phone. With email address, you want to pick one that is an up-to-date email address, and you want to pick one that is your name. So we don't want like loves horses 234 at whatever.com, right? We want your name. Um, Angela.copeland at gmail.com, for example, would be like a normal looking email address, right? It's easy to read. It's easy to know your name. Have your email address be the name that's on your resume. Have them be consistent and have that name be the name that you go by. The other thing is do not use an old email format. So if you are using AOL or Comcast, for example, or maybe even Yahoo, I think it's time to consider getting a new email address. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get rid of the one that you have, right? But if you put AOL at the top of your resume, an AOL email, the first thing an employer is going to think is, wow, this person is way behind the times when it comes to technology. That is the very last first impression that you want to be giving. So anyway, get started on your resume. This is the perfect, perfect time. 
And once you get it in good shape, go on to your LinkedIn. And I recommend use your resume as a template for LinkedIn. Some people say you should have them both be really different. I'm not sure why. I do think you want to be careful to not share anything confidential on your LinkedIn. Um, but you can absolutely have the same information. The difference, though, is that on LinkedIn, you want a photo, 100%. You need to be a real person. And the other thing is you can have recommendations. So there is a place on LinkedIn for people to leave you recommendations uh, about your work. And it's really great because they're public. Um, If you don't have recommendations yet, it's a good time to go out and ask, you know, your former coworkers, (laughs) your former boss, not your current team, former team uh, to see if they would leave you a recommendation. And if you're uncomfortable about it, you can always say, hey, listen, I'm updating my LinkedIn. Would you be interested to exchange recommendations with me? Exchange. Usually I find that if it's someone that you would want to recommend you, it's someone you'd also be comfortable recommending. So let's say you get your resume and your LinkedIn up to date. What's next? Well, you should start applying online. And you've probably heard in lots of previous episodes that I talk a lot about both applying online and going around the online process. So I'm going to give a quick, quick little bit about that, which is I really like to look up the hiring manager on LinkedIn and actually send them a message directly. And you may think like, well, Angela, I don't know who that is. Like, how would I look that person up? This is the thing. Um, If you look up their company on LinkedIn, you can look at all the employees that work at that company. And then you can sort by those who have certain job titles. So for example, if you work in marketing, there's a good chance you're going to work for a marketing director or a chief marketing officer or a vice president of marketing. So think about what the job title would normally be for your boss. And a lot of times you can reverse engineer it and you can find that person. And many times they are actually really happy that you contacted them. I have found you get a much higher response rate when you contact the person directly than when you just apply online. Because applying online is like, it's like a black hole. You probably know it's one of the most frustrating things ever. So that's where I would get started. And let's say you start getting interviews because I have seen that happen. If you start getting interviews... Be ready to take a Zoom or Skype video call from your house. You need to have a space set up that looks semi-professional in the background that is quiet. And, you know, just give it a shot. And, hey, if it doesn't go well, it's practice. It's just practice. You're kind of figuring out what you want. You know, you're getting a chance to sort of dust off your interview skills. Anyway. I hope you're having a good week. I hope the isolation hasn't gotten to you too much. And I really hope that you'll take the time to sort of look on LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and Indeed to see what jobs there are in your area for what you do. I can't make any promises, but I am going to try to record some more bonus episodes coming up. Uh, The first one was just so well-received that I want to keep giving you some tips if I can and talk a little bit about the coronavirus. If you have questions that you'd like me to address on a future episode, please send me an email. My email is Angela at copelandcoaching.com. Again, Angela at copelandcoaching.com. Thank you. And I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed the episode today, please don't forget to help me out. Go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. The more subscribers we have, the easier it is for other people to find the show. The Copeland Coaching Podcast is hosted by me, Angela Copeland. The show is edited by Daniel Lin. Our media manager is Jennifer Strafacci. You can find more episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening. I'll see you soon.